the Office of the Ombudsman. We've been around for about 30 years, uh, 29 years at the moment, uh, and over those 29 years, we've dealt with about 80,000 complaints and several hundreds of thousands of inquiries. But as Siobhan just said, we've actually received very, very few complaints with relation to the Disability Act. So I'll talk you through that over the next few minutes. Um, initially, when we were established, we had responsibility for government departments uh, on post uh, telecom Aaron at the time. Then a year later, we got local authorities and health boards, which is now obviously the HSC. Then in 2005, we were given responsibility for Part 3 of the Disability Act. So under Part 3, uh, people have a right to access, physical access to buildings. They have a right to information on services they receive. Uh, they have a right to make a complaint about sectoral plans that are produced via various government departments, etc. So in 2005, we, we, we got that responsibility. And we did expect, I have to say, uh, you know, quite a few complaints to emerge. But actually since then, on average, we've only received about six or seven complaints a year about the Disability Act. Um, and that is despite there having been a fair amount of publicity. The NDA themselves did uh, quite a lot of publicity about this. And we have done some, although I have to say we fully accept that we could do a lot more public awareness work. We're just a little bit challenged in terms of the resources that we have. Um, but people with disabilities can complain to us uh, via normal channels under the Ombudsman Act. And actually in 2007, uh, our jurisdiction was extended to include a lot of public voluntary hospitals, but also the hundreds of services that might be providing services on behalf of the HSE or with financial assistance from the HSE. So there are several hundred of those, and they would be within jurisdiction of our office. And then just last year, um, we got a new, another 180 bodies under our jurisdiction. Um, that would include the whole third level education sector, so people for the first time can make complaints about universities, about VECs. Um, other bodies that came in under jurisdiction at that time would be the National Council for Special Education, um, the Housing Authority, uh, the Disabled Drivers, Medical Appeals Board. So a number of, of, of uh, agencies, in fact doubling the number of bodies we had within remit. All citizens in this country, you all know, have rights bestowed on them by our constitution and then various pieces of primary and secondary legislation. But what is difficult is that if people aren't aware of their rights, they can't exercise those rights. So on a number of occasions, our office would speak to public bodies and remind them of the necessity to inform people about their rights. <laughs> Our experience is that when people know about their rights, they use them. If they don't know about them, they actually don't. Rights are constantly changing. Um, there's new legislation and amendments being introduced all the time. So that puts a lot of public bodies under pressure. And I think a number of people in this audience today have a huge interest in this. And I'll talk in a minute about access officers and the role that they have to play in informing people about their rights. Um, you know, there may be some access officers who, in the audience, hopefully not, but there may be some who already had a full-time job, were very, very busy just doing what they were doing, and then they were told very suddenly one day, uh, we need you to be the access officer as well. And that wouldn't be a welcome piece of information to hear from your boss if you already have a very, very busy job. But the, the, the access officer role is absolutely and utterly central, we think, to the provision of proper and good services, accessible services to people with disabilities. The heads of every public body, and there's about 650 bodies who fall, who have obligations under the Disability Act, the head of every public body has a responsibility to provide or arrange for and coordinate the provision of assistance and guidance to persons with disabilities in accessing its services. People must be told about the services of access officers and how they may access these services. If disabled people are unaware about access officers, access to particular services may seem blocked to them. Assistance with accessing services is a legal right, 
and access offices are appointed for this purpose. Of the few complaints that we get to our office every year, many of them are due to the fact that the person or a, a person perhaps advocating on their behalf wasn't aware that there was an access officer. They were having a problem with the public body, be it a local authority, be it a hospital, whatever. And they had difficulty getting the frontline service person they were dealing with to understand their complaint or to deal with them. They made contact with our office and we were able to say, well, hang on, were you not put in touch with an access officer? We might contact the public body. And on a number of instances, an access officer was suddenly manufactured, was actually created uh, in response to our inquiry. We would say to public bodies, there is no point in you having an access officer unless that access officer has a job description, has time to perform their duties, has an interest in performing their duties, and will go about doing the job very proactively. So not just waiting until somebody looks for your service, but actually going out there and saying, scanning the environment around you, predicting what might cause accessibility issues, um, and working with the management to ensure that you proactively address those issues. It's very important that all staff in an organisation know who the access officer is. Often somebody might ring a reception, ring a switch and ask to be put through the, to the access officer and the person doesn't know. So it's really, really important that all staff of an organisation are aware of who the access officer is and what their role is. There should be very good signposting to the access officer and not just relying on a website, as you all know, not everybody, everybody uses the internet. So a variety of ways of signposting uh, users of the service towards that access officer. Uh, I apologise, I, I was listening to the, the talk there on universal design, feeling extremely guilty about my slides, so apologies for people who cannot read uh, these uh, mea culpa, um, but I'm kind of going to talk through a little bit of them anyway. Um, disability awareness training is absolutely critical in every organisation. Some of us might think we have a fairly good understanding of what, what it means to have a disability, but I think you know, most people have something to learn about various disabilities and implications of disability out there. Every organisation should run disability awareness training quite regularly. Um, and staff should feel obliged to attend that because there can be always something new that they will learn. Some of the classics that people come to us and complain about is that somebody with a visual impairment um, has somebody coming up and talking to them without introducing themselves, their name or what their position is, be it that they be a housing officer or they're a doctor or a nurse, etc. Um, people who have hearing impairments People having conversations in front of them, looking very serious, uh, looking very worrying, without things being explained to them, what the conversations are happening. Um, people investing in putting wonderful braille signs on doors, but if the person with the visual impairment doesn't know where the door is in the first place, um, it's not exactly helpful. Um, regularly, people using, trying to access our services uh, would find it difficult where we have asked perhaps for a complaint to be written down. Now, obviously, we do provide services and we do assist people to write things down. But understanding that maybe some people with dyslexia, for example, mightn't like filling in forms. Or if they do, they mightn't like to put too much detail down there. They'll keep it short. And maybe part of the message gets missed. So we would very much encourage all access officers and all public bodies to ensure that there is regular disability awareness training for staff. And I know I'm not the only person to have said that today. Um, again, this, the, the, what's on this slide really is information that's on the accessibility.ie website. So we would encourage access officers to use that information that is available that the NDA has published. Complaints and appeals. Um, most public bodies do not particularly like when complaints are made. And I would say that ourselves in our own organisation, we get complaints about what we do. And it's never particularly pleasant. Most people in this day and age now are working, you know, working hard. They're very, very, very busy. A complaint may come in. They may say, gosh, to examine this properly, I need to give this a lot of time. And people often don't have a lot of time. But we would encourage all public bodies to look at complaints 
differently, to really try and see them in a positive light. When you think that there are organisations out there in the retail industry who pay private, what do they call them, private shoppers or secret shoppers, is it? Mr. Shoppers, etc., to go around and test the service and give feedback, they're paying for that service. Whereas actually, all of us who have complaint systems, we can get feedback, good and bad, about how we're doing. And so we should really try to embrace that system of, of, of complaints and, and learn from it. And I use an example. Some of you may have heard of um, a major scandal in the UK in the last few years called the Mid-Staffordshire scandal, which involved a group of hospitals. Um, and that group of hospitals, over a period of time, it has since been found that there were a thousand, at least, unnecessary deaths, unavoid or sorry, avoidable deaths in those, those hospitals. Um, there were very serious breaches of standards, very, very serious. The government there you know, commissioned a massive investigation which cost millions and got evidence from hundreds of people, etc. Um, it was awful the way people were treated, sick people in hospital, their families, etc. But during the investigation, it transpired that hundreds of complaints had been made from the very, very early days that had those complaints been listened to, would have immediately pointed to deficits in care. For example, and it seems shocking, in one of the hospitals, because water wasn't being delivered to patients, they had actually started a practice that water had to be prescribed. So if a person was dehydrated, the doctors actually started prescribing water to make sure that the, the patient was given water every day. Now, had those simple little complaints been identified early on and, and you know, responded to, that actually could have prevented deaths later on. We often describe complaints as the canary in the coal mine. So you'll recall, or you might have read about years and years and years ago, when the guys went down the mines, they left a canary there in a little cage, and if the canary keeled over, that was a sign of a build-up of gas, and they all got out really quickly. We should see complaints as that, as a, as a good warning system for us, and we should look at them positively. And yes, some complaints may be a little bit trivial, may be a little bit vexatious, but mixed in with those, there's often very, very useful information for us. And in terms of appeals, public services that provide, uh, be it a benefit, various different types of service, it is really critically important that they have a very robust appeals structure in place. Again, within our office, uh, and you know, we're learning and improving or trying to improve all the time, where a complaint where we don't uphold somebody's complaint to us, we tell them that we have an internal appeal system. We ensure that somebody new who hasn't been involved in the examination of their complaint to date, somebody new will be assigned this case and will relook at it with fresh eyes. And we have an appeals manager, etc. We have a structure in place to make sure that we give it independent and proper a proper review. Under the Disability Act, um, what it says about complaints is, is, is quite simple. It says, first and foremost, the head of the public body has to ensure compliance with the Disability Act. So that's a fairly onerous responsibility on the head of the public body. And hence, if there isn't compliance, if there isn't compliance about there not being an access officer, or if there isn't compliance around physical access or access to information, that head of the public body is responsible. It's very clear who is responsible. So if there is a complaint about non-compliance with the Disability Act, the public body must appoint an inquiry officer. They must appoint an inquiry officer. And that inquiry officer then uh, must make a determination on whether the body was in compliance with the Act or not, um, and must report his or her recommendation to the head of the public body. And it is very much expected that if an inquiry officer finds that there has been some breach, that there isn't compliance with the Disability Act, that the head of the public body would take immediate action to, to rectify that. On our, on our web, website, we have a number of resource tools that may be of assistance to some of you. We have one document called Listen, Respond, Learn and Improve, which is the Ombudsman's Guide to Setting Up and Operating an Internal Complaint System. We just republished that. We revised it and republished it in April of this year. We have another document called Six Rules for Getting It Right. 
the Ombudsman's Guide to Good Public Administration that we just published also this year. And that is to, I suppose it's a standard as such. It's our standard of what good public administration looks like, what, what we expect public bodies to provide. And if you or somebody belonging to you wants to make a complaint and you're kind of wondering, are you being reasonable or unreasonable and how should you frame it, those resource tools can be quite useful at allowing you to do so. Um, I, I didn't want to take up too much of your time this morning, but I do promise you that if anybody does require any additional information, there is a lot on our website. We also have a low call number, and we'd be happy to make anybody available to discuss any issue with you at any point in time. Thank you.